Stubborn. That's the one word I'd use to describe this race that has single-handedly broken every convention of every xeno-anthropological model that had existed prior to their wretched entry into the galactic scene. I should know. I co-authored it. Every xeno Am student knows well what happens when a civilization reaches critical mass on their cradle world. It comes in different flavours, sure, but it's more of the same. 1. Nuclear hellfire and devastation leading to a mass exodus. 2. Rapid ecological collapse, precipitated and catalyzed by an irreversible runway, cascade failure of atmospheric, environmental, oceanic and what have yous, leading to a mass exodus. 3. Or most boringly of all, depletion of the cradle world's resources and the inability to sustain the life support necessary to keep it operational, again leading to a mass exodus. 4. That or some other novel affair such as runaway grey goo, bioweapons gone rampant, once more leading to a mass exodus. Everyone gets the idea. It's a thing that has to happen. That must happen. It's a watershed point for a species to finally get their asses in line to face the cold and unbearable truth. That the universe doesn't give a damn about what the politicians of old say. You can't break the will of nature. You can't fix what is unfixable. And yet here they are. Humanity. Proudly proclaiming the announcement of their entry into the galactic community from the comfort of their cradle world. A class 7 civilization, mind you. That's the first of the long line of paradigm changing issues humanity has inflicted upon my poor field of expertise. Let me compare and contrast. Everyone has learned of the titular grain pains of intrasolar colonization. Everyone knows that once the crater world's gone, the population is forced to endure this long period of slow, painful growth. Physiologists will change to adapt to a lack of gravity because of the sheer lack of material, tech, resources, to really go for artificial gravity. At this point, many had a choice of creating more expensive spin habitats, or simply packing as many people into a tin can as possible to save as many from the dying crater world. Many choose the latter. In fact, all of us choose the latter. Which brings me to my point. Humans circumvented this entirely. Because humans never felt the need, the drive, to leave their cradle world. Their stubbornness created a dangerous fight or die mentality that permeated throughout their political ideologies at the time. It was save the cradle world or die trying. And by the ancestors, they really did brave it out. Massive underground caverns, entire mountains hollowed out, cities domed, flood barriers erected. They tried to save as many as they could from all the sins of their forebearers' vices. Ecologic and natural disasters hit them constantly. Hundreds of millions perished, yet they saved billions by sheer stubbornness. They didn't give up. And so, when the waves subsided, when the air settled, they sent out ships not to abandon their cradle, not to leave for a brighter future amongst the stars, but in an attempt to save their cradle. Their pioneers have one ultimate goal in mind. Gather resources, advance technology, save the Earth. Colonization of their home system was a mere adjunct to that goal. They mined out their moon, shunted their entire industrial apparatus into space, far away from their fragile home, and began building. This was their version of the First Age. I'm not done, however. Decades, centuries passed. The Second Age was upon us. The Age of Cruel Expansion and Recovery. At this point, we were still struggling to maintain our population in the unforgiving climate of space. Humanity? Well, they managed to prosper underground and inside their domes. It was easier to hollow out another room underground, to establish another dome on the surface. It was far more difficult for us to add another module to a space habitat. And by this point, they were working on something. Something big. Something insane. Let's get forward a millennia, shall we? Towards the Third Age. The Age of Rebirth. At this point, most of our contemporary civilizations would have had enough time to establish strong, resilient industries and supply chains. We could finally focus on our quality of life. We could finally stop surviving and begin thriving. Most humans would assume we'd focus on spin habitats or artificial gravity at this point, but we didn't. Because of the centuries in space, we'd atrophied. There was no real use of generating artificial gravity anymore when we had already become so weak, so we accepted things the way they were. Any and all hopes and dreams of returning to our cradles to end up with this may saw a return as a risk of breaking societal cohesion. For if we engineered a divergent species to endure the harsh realities of gravity, will they not see us as something completely different? Our cultures, our societies, because of our mass exoduses, lost much in the way of our old identity. We were now spacers, bound to this prison amongst the stars. 
This is where we would remain, and where we would vow to carve a home out of. Humanity at this point have finalised the final few pieces of their insane plan. The Planetary Atmospheric and Ecological Stabilisation Network, or the PASCAN, as they love to abbreviate it. They constructed massive air scrubbers, space elevators, an entire orbital ring and novel technologies to maintain all of these megastructures. They were planning to resuscitate their dead world. Imagine it. Towers that crept up, reaching to the stars. Hundreds, if not thousands of them. Then, massive towers that went deep into the depths underneath the surface. The crust. The mantle. They were quite literally putting their world on life support. So from the depths of their planet to the very edge of space, they kept building. Ensuring every aspect of this insane plan had redundancy after redundancy accounted for. Until one day, at the point where most of us were switching on our FTL drives for the very first time, marvelling at the possibilities of discovering new systems to mine and colonise, humanity has switched on the final components of their planetary machine, at last returning their cradle to its former glory, and for the very first time, living on the surface as they'd hoped and worked for for millennia. So while the third age for us was marked with prosperity, it was a prosperity marked with the loss of our old culture, and even a rejection of our previous planet-bound forms. It was the death of a species and the rebirth of another. The FTL drive cemented this. We will be spacebound forever. Many humans would call this the point where we permanently decided to give up, and I would be inclined to agree with them. Humanity's third age, however, was marked with the ultimate reward to their stubbornness, the rebirth of their world, a victory for their kind. Many of my contemporaries would see the lack of an FTL drive on humanity's end as a more pronounced and objective failure, yet... As the fourth age, the second collapse would prove, there couldn't be further from the truth. Let's once more fast forward a few centuries to the fourth age, the second collapse. The colonisation of new star systems so far away from our central governments caused friction, tension, and eventually a great conflict seen in all other civilizations going by the old model. We would once more face stagnation, face destitute, holding out on rickety stations, and ramshackled ships. Humanity... They couldn't even remotely imagine experiencing this second collapse. For a millennia of united efforts in preserving their old world culture, on fixing their past mistakes, had wisened them to the notion of species-wide cooperation. Their tough early years had made them vow to make things better for the next generation. And without any of our issues of the distance of space and time breaking up our social cohesion, humanity banded together even tighter. Their massive intrastellar industries were now geared towards creating a veritable utopia, material excesses for all, and abundance in everything. A society now united not for personal greed or profit, or vying for independence on disparate colonies and stations, but a society united for the betterment and improvement of all. Stubbornness got them to this point. And while we fought amongst the stars some more, our FDL drives a gift and a great curse, humanity focused inwards. They'd achieved so much in so little time. Advanced sciences and technologies for the sheer sake of discovery. And without knowledge of FTL, they went ham on fields we'd overlooked, or put on the back burner due to the sheer emphasis on survival after the second collapse. Fast forward another millennia. To the fifth age. The age of reconciliation. Or as I would personally dub, the age of humanity. We finally crawled out of the depths and pits of despair after centuries of infighting. Finally seeing the faults in our development, we established the Galactic Union. Humanity had just created their first FTL drive at this point appearing on the Elitian's doorstep, and unwittingly putting themselves on the centre stage of the Galactic Union's first true trial. Their first ship was a colossus none of us had ever even dreamed of building. A 20 kilometre long behemoth, teeming and brimming with technologies exotic to us all. There were only a handful of humans on that ship, from what we've gathered from the Elitian's first contact. Most of it was automated, or at least that's what we assumed. Rumours of AI floated about, but we couldn't confirm anything. We couldn't gather more from the Elitians, given most present in those historical moments of first contact, had been reduced to cosmic dust. After hearing of the human captain's proclamation of their relatively new burgeoning FTL status, several self-serving Elitian admirals, believing this would be the time to put a young space-faring civilization in its place, they planned on taking their ship for themselves, finally regaining the glory lost in their entrance into the Galactic Union. It took about a week before the entirety of what was formerly the Elitian Empire to be reduced to rubble. Yet the very next week, we received an influx of billions of refugees. They flooded into our Union stations, almost collapsing our economy by the sheer necessity to feed and house them all. The message from humanity was clear. They were here, and they would not tolerate infractions. 
yet they were reasonable and destroyed only those that threatened them. It just so happens that the entirety of the Empire was a threat, not its citizens. Relations with the humans are now cordial. They'd reach out to rehouse and rebuild the former Empire stations and habitats. When we inquired what their terms for reparations were, they noted how we had seemingly no use for planets and moons for the most part, and requested sovereignty over most of the former elite and Empire's terrestrial bodies. This was acceptable to us, and to the surviving Elitians. The humans soon took these worlds. Literally. They broke down these planets into pieces using techniques and machines unknown to us, breaking them down and shipping them back to their precious home. In a span of a few decades, all but a handful of moons were simply gone. The former Elitian Empire spanned a total of 27 star systems, mind you. It was only last week, and with great trepidation, that I asked the most recent human envoy, an android of sorts, his human user tucked away safely on Earth, as to what they were planning to do with the broken down planets. They responded simply, We're expanding our home. Reports of Sol's primary star intermittently dimming have surfaced within the past few months. It would appear that humanity is planning something big. Many doubt the veracity of these reports, claiming that this could be posturing. An expensive method of posturing, but posturing nonetheless. Some even assume this would be humanity's downfall, a story of hubris. One simply cannot deny the natural laws. One simply cannot engineer oneself a machine that contained nature on such a scale. I, however, know that can never be the case. Because humanity is stubborn. And whatever they're planning, they will succeed. <laughs>